the um, center of the earth allows us to look at the world with a certain privilege, especially at the ways that global governance is failing us, is paralyzed. And that's particularly the case with the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. It's structural defects, and our witnessing those in Durban will be clear. And some of the public health framings, I think, are going to be increasingly necessary to deal with these defects with global environmental health, a new and terribly important subdiscipline. It allows us to start assessing a generalized bill, a north-south bill, and uh, I've got the biggest uh, carbon debt and carbon footprint and climate debt you can imagine. So I'm very interested in ways that fair and effective payment mechanisms that build on a solidaristic sensibility uh, people to people in the way that the German Watch NGO that made that film were seeking. They were seeking to influence global, but what I'm going to argue they did in um, local ways is a very interesting pilot for us. And it lets us think about climate justice, local and global. And for those of you who are in the health um, uh, discipline and know about uh, AIDS and, and uh, treatment, I'll give you a, a very inspiring example to conclude, if there's still time, why I have hope that this apparently inexorable problem of, of getting climate justice um, when there's so much injustice, a climate gamble that's based on privatizing the air that I'll describe, carbon trading, clean development mechanisms that can't deliver the money, and a general problem of civil society divided between civilized society endorsing the mainstream strategies, um, the green economy, payment for ecosystem services, carbon trading, and a more uncivilized society, the people that I hang out with, I'll show you about them. And my ideal was um, a strategy here to um, address all of the systems that remain fossil addicted. There's not time in the 50 minutes I have, but energy, transport, agriculture, industrial production, consumption, disposal, and healthcare are all on the table for rethinking. And I've lived in South Africa 24 years, and it's the same situation. Everything's on the table, and it has been since I arrived in 1990. And since exactly 20 years ago, next week, we got democracy. Things are in flux. The elites haven't sorted out uh, these systems. Their attempts to address um, the problems, you correct a market-related problem through a market solution. It's the uh, pervasive ideology of neoliberalism. Financialization terrain that you all are so familiar with here. This is what we call a privatization of the air or other geotechnical fixes, false solutions we call them. That first line of defense is failing. So we've just seen the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's second uh, report in the new series. We're very acutely aware of the um, ways that public health enters the debate that I won't even dwell on very much. But what I think this opportunity now uh, allows us is a new um, a chance to connect the dots between victims and villains, causes and effects, the global north and south. And global environmental health is very important for us. But um, as much as we require multilateral cooperation, to do this properly in the way that the ozone hole was addressed in 1987 in the Montreal Protocol. We're not there. And the reason is we haven't sorted out who wins and who loses. And that's the objective of this talk, is to begin to work through climate justice. We have policy paralysis. We'll see it again in Peru uh, at the end of this year. We'll see it next year in Paris. The global elites and the UNFCCC are not going to solve the problem a far stronger emphasis on solidaristic solutions is going to be required. And within that, human health will, of course, be central. That's the abstract. This is what I want to do in 45 min next minutes. It is laid out in a book, in fact, that Brendan from uh, UW's uh, geography department also contributed to. So if anyone wants some of the argumentation, climate talk uh, by some of our Norwegian South African colleagues, and we had a, a token uh, Yankee here, Brendan, uh, helping us on contesting climate injustice during COP17, the Durban uh, Climate Summit in 2011. But you don't need to know any more than a quick glance at OSO and the ways in which um, not just clear cutting, but um, durable rain that left, I believe it's 39 dead at the latest count, and many more probably to come, and a connectivity that's now becoming a little bit more explicit. Um, I know that this is hotly contested. You can never accuse one storm of being a climate uh, event, but 
um, climate change is going to make mudslides much more common. The rain that you've experienced in, in Washington um, in the past uh, month or so shows that, but it's a function of rising temperature that increases uh, vapor in the mo uh, uh, in, in the uh, moisture in the atmosphere, and heavy precipitation days have increased dramatically, and you haven't been alone in these events. I could uh, give you uh, uh, literally dozens of huge uh, extreme storm events involving massive rain, maybe most uh, poignantly where Pakistan, about a third of the country, was inundated. Or even a couple of months ago, you probably looked across the English Channel or across the Atlantic and found uh, the Thames Valley uh, under water. We also at the same time had extraordinary rains and you probably know that uh, South Africa has uh, an energy addiction uh, because of our huge mining complex and that addiction is very much related to coal which supplies 93% of our energy. It's uh, more than half open cast which means um, the coal-fired power plants that make South Africa 20 times worse per unit of capita uh, uh, GDP in uh, CO2 emissions than even the United States. Well, that coal gets wet, and that means if you feed it into those stations, it becomes like soup. And we actually had our first total national blackout, uh, a load shed it's called, um, last month. And, and it was extraordinary because it finally began to dawn on people that there's so much moisture in the air in these parts of the country, a place called Mpumalanga, where these coal-fired power plants are. And that's because there's so many greenhouse gases floating around in the atmosphere. And in Africa, there's one uh, particular company that's responsible for 40% of South Africa's, which in turn is 40% of the continent's uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And that's ESCOM with its coal-fired power plants, which causes more moisture, which causes more rain, which causes the coal to get wet, which causes ESCOM to turn off. And connecting the dots like that is something I'm going to hope that we're going to increasingly be able to do. I hope we able, were able to do that because another connection between um, Durban and many of you would be uh, your awareness. I hope that we are addressing AIDS, not only through, as I'll explain at the end, treatment, but there's some extraordinary preventative measures. There's even a vaccine being worked on at my university. And it's just to brag that if some of you are working in the public health sphere and you're thinking about an African partner, you can't get better than these folks, um, Salim Karim and Karesha Karim, who've recently made the news with, um, with um, um, a gel that uh, has cut, I think, the transmission rate by 37%. So it's seen as a huge advance. We also, like geographers in Durban, we hosted uh, last year the Antipode um, Institute. So many of you who have had a sense that uh, geography is strong in South Africa can be affirmed. And I think the connection that I'd like to dwell on the most is with, uh, with this problem. What do we do with this extraordinary increase in container uh, traffic, which is part and parcel of restructuring economies. And those of your geographers who are doing um, uh, economic geography can go on at length about the changing nature of shipping. Well, the climate implications affect you here and us in Durban with the largest port in Africa, especially because you've got some very creative PR people in this town, I can see. Eh? They're, they're claiming your port's particularly green. I want to come back and contest that. But I do want you to know that this is a problem, a pervasive problem. I think our supervisor called it urban entrepreneurial competition, right, Matt? And um, if you got um, kudos for turning out your big light uh, last month, did anybody watch the Earth Hour? You know that it was sponsored by WWF to help Seattle and a lot of other cities claim to be uh, green and, and addressing climate. And Durban was one of the 34 finalists for the We Love Cities uh, uh, contest that the WWF, I, I hope, there, are there any WWF uh, members in the, in the room? Because I understand that given some of the claims, WWF has had to change its name, its nickname, its, its logo, because there's a little bit of um, uh, public relations going on here to claim uh, seven and a half um, megawatts of electricity produced from landfill waste. Um, in fact, it wasn't just that. Last month, um, we found that the company that the city hired to promote this had started doing a little over-enthusiastic uh, social media work, um, setting up uh, numerous fake Twitter accounts to promote how we love Durban. So we've had these greenwashing deceits, but the content is really what's critical for us because it's there that those of you who know about landfills, and particularly those that include incineration of toxic waste and especially healthcare, there is again with, with Annie Leonard having set up 
um, Healthcare Without Harm and the uh, Global um, Anti-Incineration Alliance, a lot of progress in this country, but in South Africa, we've got a very big problem where you've got bragging rights by a city to having set up um, an electricity um, from methane generation plant at the largest landfill in Africa, which is this one. Um, and this uh, landfill is terribly important for our climate justice movement because um, it's where the clean development mechanism pilot, the carbon trading strategy, was first tried out starting in 2002. What's critical though before that is that some of you who might know about social movements will have heard of Abishladi Basan Jandolo. Kennedy Road was their particularly important uh, base for a long time. And that dump was put into this black area. In South Africa, black includes African, colored, and Indian in 1980 as an apartheid sort of technique to displace the huge amount of, of landfill waste generated in Durban and now put into this black neighborhood. Environmental racism in a very acute way. Um, you probably know that the whole EJ movement kind of came to be as a, as a consciousness, as a movement in Warren County, North Carolina, over a similar kind of introduction of a landfill with toxics, PCB it was in, in North Carolina. And, um, Robert Bullard got the whole environmental racism analysis up and running with, with that project. Very similar here, sort of an Aaron Brockovich figure called Sajida Khan, who um, uh, died in 2007, but before doing so was uh, instrumental in setting up a climate justice consciousness. And she was an ordinary suburban resident who died of cancer from being next to this toxic dump where there was a healthcare incinerator. And that uh, landfill, included an opportunity to pipe out the methane to turn it into electricity. And to do that uh, required about um, $12 million of outside funds. And that was provided through the World Bank uh, by selling the carbon credits to the world market under the assumption that had that money not been there, then they wouldn't have done the project. It's what uh, is called additionality that you are required to show if it's not for this additional funding from the um, uh, international uh, carbon markets and offsets, we can't do the project. And this is part and parcel of solving the climate crisis with a market solution. It turned out that was a fib. And so much, including Sajida Khan's death, so much followed from that, partly because we set up in 2004 with Sajida's help um, a, uh, a Durban group for climate justice, aficionados of of uh, climate debates know that this is where a systematic critique of carbon trading really began and took root, coming from people like Sajida who were sort of grassroots activists involved in innumerable struggles with systems of power that in turn taught professional academics what was really going on in these carbon trading. So we followed the story. We work with a network called EJOLT, the Environmental Justice Organizations, Liabilities and Trade, which has taken this kind of praxis epistemology approach a lot further arguing um, in this particular report to decommission the um, uh, clean development mechanism and, and close down carbon trading so as to start a um, much more directed strategy, um, which I'll come into. EJOLT, I'll just um, let you know if some of you do environmental justice and health and looking for case studies. We've just put last month 900 uh, quite detailed maps out at ejolt.org. And um, our little center did the Africa mapping. We're about halfway through, and we really would love your feedback as to what could be done in the terrain that you know. Some of them we've put up last week on Pambazuka, the main e-zine in Africa. Mainly struggles that not only relate to injustices visited upon Africans by particularly multinational corporates doing extractive, but now a, a new breed of uh, those corporates I'll come back to called BRICS, the Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. What that means is when we're looking at the world from South Africa and from many of these African sites, it's with a great deal of skepticism because we've seen a great many uh, global gov initiatives. So the global governance strategy to deal with environment took a turn after Rio in 1992 10 years of neoliberalism generated a new strategy, neoliberalizing nature, that included instead of government to government deals to uh, address big problems, I'll mention again the, the uh, uh, ozone hole, addressed through a ban on chlorofluorocarbons in 1987. Something had changed with Bill Clinton's presidency and George W. Bush, and by 2002, especially with the influence of the United States in these negotiations, we'll come back to Kyoto Protocol as well, 
we began to find ecological modernization and strategies that were terribly unjust. The privatization of water was rampant in Johannesburg, putting the city along with Cochabamba, Bolivia, at the top of the World Water War rankings. Um, the um, carbon trading that we began to witness uh, in Durban started then, and we saw in the United Nations negotiations in a suburb called Santon, a very rich suburb, um, the UN blockaded in and 30,000 protesters really for the first time saying, United Nations, this isn't working, go home. This is not uh, sustainable development. Um, it's a paralysis, in fact, in dealing with the problems. How many of you remember what was said about climate change at the WSSD in Johannesburg, 2002? Well, you were paying attention because they didn't say anything about climate change at all at that uh, WSSD, did they? They just ignored the problem. I think partly, as I'll argue, because the host was terribly insensitive. On the one hand, drawing in as much of the rhetoric of sustainable development, but failing to contest the reality of um, profit, self-regulation, and unfair trade. And those are the techniques of twisting and turning, talking left, walking right, that we've become familiar with, not just in South Africa, but I think you'd have to admit, if you look at a whole long list, as I'll do, um, that global governance as a whole remains paralyzed, partly because of a neoliberal ideology and the balance of forces being so adverse, and partly if the UN isn't being uh, funded by the US, dues Gisler, then they go to corporations. The Global Compact was happening about then. So we really found um, this um, process incredibly uh, stultifying, and that was witnessed again uh, in my hometown in Durban in 2011. At the convention center uh, was the COP17. Uh, that was this kind of strange uh, representation that this is what's called a baobab tree which can exist for centuries without needing water, more or less. Um, we found instead it was actually uh, not a symbol of success, of resilience, but of actually um, a party that would result in a bry. And the only thing that was really going on ultimately was an attempt to restore some faith after the Copenhagen disaster two years earlier and Cancun, uh, which accomplished nothing in between. So, the Financial Times declared a, a great victory for carbon markets. I'll come back to that because that didn't really seem to help. So what we saw was our foreign minister, Maite Nkwana Mashabani, applauded for what ultimately the activists who had a hard time saying United Nations Conference, or I can't even say it, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change Conference of the Parties, 17. Ah, conference of the polluters, because they really couldn't do anything to, to change. COP18, uh, occurred just um, at the time uh, a little island was suffering enormously from climate change. Uh, the island is uh, noted for, uh, in fact, quite notorious lack of climate consciousness. But overnight, about $60 billion hit this island, Manhattan, <laughs> and uh, surrounds, and left uh, the people much more conscious about climate change. And the mayor, Mayor Bloomberg, suddenly found $20 billion to start climate proofing Manhattan. What it raised, though, for the purposes of Doha, the COP18, um, was loss and damage. So this is one of the moments where we begin to find um, the liabilities for this huge destruction of climate change coming onto the agenda, which is what I want to, to dwell on a little bit now, because um, it's a hotly contested question. Um, when Todd Stern, your negotiator in the U.S. State Department the last few years, um, at the climate summits, he was asked, about um, the climate debt that the North owes the South, that sense of guilt or culpability or reparations, I just categorically reject that. Now, thanks to, um, this is the rejection, by the way, of polluter pays principle. This is a, a fairly profound attack by this man on behalf of your fossil fuel industries on um, even logic of uh, what we could call a, a sort of reformed, ecologically modernized economics. We learned more about why that was because of um, Chelsea Manning's disclosures and the WikiLeaks publications of the State Department cables just uh, ending in February 2010 after Copenhagen. And we learned there about the bullying and the bribery, the cajoling that Stern and Jonathan Pershing applied to people like Mela Sanawi, a dictator from Ethiopia who recently passed away. But he was the co-chair of the African Union's strategies to generate climate debt argumentation. He um, went to uh, Copenhagen via Paris and met Sarkozy and, and cut the uh, claims in half. And there's some very revealing State Department cables about 
negotiations between the Assistant Secretary of State for Africa, Johnny Carson, and Mela Sanawi. Most poignant might, though, have been, I think, this group in the Maldives. Did anybody remember the president and his cabinet having a, uh, a, a cabinet meeting underwater in scuba gear to dramatize the sinking of their island? Very dramatic. But it turned out just weeks after that, um, Stern arranged a $50 million bribe so that the um, Maldives uh, leadership would accept the Copenhagen Accord, which they'd vowed to, to oppose. Um, and it just struck us then, we have the best cartoonist in, in Africa, actually this, in, maybe in the English-speaking world, Jonathan Zapiro. It struck us that um, there's a structural problem of these negotiations where the delegates go to basically demand that their national um, uh, rights to pollute be increased up to the ceiling, and then they break the ceiling. So there's a sort of tendency of each of the delegations to represent their fossil fuel industries, their industrial industries, their transport and, and energy industries to, to um, uh, maximize emissions. So we're never really going to get a deal under these circumstances. And this is not uncommon in uh, GlobalGov because although 1987 was the high point, we also had at that point a Brundtland Commission that was quite uh, far-reaching in its understanding of what sustainable development could mean. So it's always worth going back and looking not just at intergenerational equity that the Brundtland Commission is known for, but the ways in which Brundtland addressed ecological and social needs, which are quite radical. After that, we've had about a quarter century or more of, of um, failures to reform these institutions. The World Bank and IMF annual meetings, like the one uh, last week, um, that was noted for the United States refusing to top up the IMF and to reform voting there. Um, the trivial reforms in the IMF and World Bank have largely been at the scale of which elites from uh, the emerging markets, BRICS especially, will have a little bit more power, while Africa as a whole falls in voting share. An attempt to change the ideology was made. In fact, the man who did so, Joseph Stiglitz, won the Nobel Prize in 2001, but in 1998, when he introduced the idea, post-Washington consensus, a year and a half later, Larry Summers had him fired. The um, Millennium Development Goal strategies are described by a feminist group in the, uh, called Dawn as the maximum distraction gimmicks. They've missed their targets, and many of them are uh, suffused with neoliberalism in any case. The Doha Agenda, um, even though in um, uh, last year um, in, uh, I think it was in Indonesia, is that right? In, in uh, Bali, they were able to restructure some of the argumentation to pretend that the WTO continues, it's more or less dead. And many of you here in Seattle will know why that is, because it started here in 1999 and uh, November uh, 30, um, a delegitimization of the WTO for its adverse power relationships. And they've never changed power relations, although they've been able to swing a few minor side deals. But the WTO for restructuring world trade in a rational way just isn't working. Nor is the attempt to do global financial architecture. After the emerging markets crisis of the late 90s, they met in uh, Monterey, finance ministers, central bankers, and they tried to get a financing for development project going. And then the G20 regularly met during especially the heat of the crisis uh, in 2008, 9, 10, 11, 12, and still meet today with no uh, visible progress on restructuring global finance and developing a new uh, solid world financial architecture. Um, we've got renewed wars in Central Asia and the Middle East that just seem infinite and no possibilities in the United Nations Security Council for resolving geopolitical problems. Attempt to reform the Security Council by bringing in the two biggest African countries, South Africa and Nigeria, by bringing in Brazil or India or Germany or Japan just have been fail failing persistently. The G8 promises that have been made, again, especially to Africa for aid, we're all broken. And then the Kyoto Protocol represents, I think, and I'll make this argument in a little more detail right now, not just um, the aftermath with Copenhagen, Cancun, Durban, Doha, and Warsaw last year, uh, global governance failure again. And in Warsaw, the attempt to generate advocacy from within the COP, especially by our colleagues here in the Pan-African Climate Justice Alliance, they went nowhere. And Paksha ran... Um, out of patience, and then decided to walk out. Uh, Mitika Mwenda, who is the leader of Paksha, 
uh, actually drew all of the NGOs with like one or two exceptions out as a protest. And they've begun to say, well, look, we've got to change. This insider approach within these climate negotiations just isn't working. We need to name names and shame them. And as uh, Dipti Batnagar from the Friends of the Earth Mozambique chapter, just Shambayantal, says we need mobilizations and to reach the real issues, connecting the dots, right, to food and security, in extreme storms, energy, sea level rise. And it just reminded us something I learned when I was a student at uh, Johns Hopkins uh, of the uh, old metaphor that Jesse Jackson gave us, that to get that nice jam, right, you need to... Uh, have some tree shakers, right, if you're going to be a good jam maker. And we've got to then ask, okay, what's this role of civil society advocacy? Um, we have some civilized society advocates inside, and many of them have bought into the lines of arguments. And the climate justice, uncivilized society, are outside and never heard, never brought in. The attempts to do this globally aren't working. The jumping of scales may be premature. Um, and as a result, when you see a Copenhagen, you kind of understand the power structure. The insider strategy has always meant appealing to Europe, and NGOs in Europe work very closely with their governments. NGOs in the United States have a lot of problems. But um, we understand a lot more, again, thanks to Chelsea Manning and Ed Snowden's bringing us uh, a lot more information as well, about how the US does sabotage in these relationships. They play a significant role the uh, SIGINT, the, uh, the sp uh, spying, and keeping our negotiators as well informed as possible. Um, and these are the kinds of techniques that I think mean it's increasingly easy to say to uh, State Department, when you go to the climate summits, you are simply sabotaging. Don't go. And I think you'll find in the run-up to uh, not just Peru this year, but Paris next, calls for US state, and anybody really in Washington, World Bank, all these guys, just not to go. And maybe you'll start seeing uh, activists who are working now on divestment of big corporations also begin to block the Dulles uh, Airport access road around November this year. And it's not just the US. There are four others, Canada, Russia, Japan, Australia, that make it extremely unlikely to get a deal. And they're now in this relationship with four big uh, emerging markets, which are uh, South Africa, Jacob Zuma, Brazil, Lula, and now Dilma. Uh, Wen Jibao, now replaced by Xi Jinping, and uh, Manmohan Singh, probably replaced by Modi in a few weeks. And this is the recipe for destroying the United Nations. This is the deal-making in which a G20 replaces a G8. A basic, Brazil, South Africa, um, India, and China, now conjoins with, uh, with Barack Obama and does a secret side deal, which uh, led to a non-binding agreement with a four-degree increase guaranteed. Those countries also meet on their own. This was them exactly a year ago in Durban at the BRICS meeting. And that meeting was notable because like another meeting, which happened in 1885, where five countries got very aggressive with Africa, thinking about what can we get out of Africa? We need uh, ports and we need uh, uh, railroads. We need some roads. We need some plantations and mines. And we need to basically take the raw materials of Africa, uh, a scramble for Africa, uh, oil, gas, land now grabs and minerals is occurring again. Now, BRICS has entered this debate in an interesting way geopolitically, which should give us hope for climate negotiations, if you believe the rhetoric, because BRICS is against the legacy of slavery and colonialism, neoliberalism and, and neocolonialism. They say they don't like the look of Africa um, ready for uh, consumption. But the big question is, it's not uh, anti-imperialist, but perhaps a sub-imperialist arrangement. BRICS is not against, but within this arrangement, as we saw with the climate summit in Copenhagen, where, of course, if Africa is going to be consumed, better to have it cooked. And that's what they did there. And you'll see that's what's happening with so much of the uh, new emissions leadership on either an absolute basis with China in the lead or on a per capita basis with Russia and South Africa on the top 10. And that brings us finally to, not finally, we have a couple more topics, but who owes? Um, and you'll see on a per capita basis in just one snapshot year, South Africa is part of this. Of course, it's the US and Canada. Um, it's Saudi Arabia, Kazakhstan, and um, 
and Russia and Australia. These are the major emitters per person. But this is underestimating because it doesn't include the offshoring of a lot of the emissions that used to be in the United States and now have been outsourced. You can sort of put all of your industrial uh, infrastructure into the east coast of China and bring your emissions down a little bit as the US has done. But you're importing uh, the, the emissions through the cheap goods. And then you look at who is the creditor. And of course, it's going to be these uh, Central American, Caribbean, especially the Andes nations. It's going to be the uh, South uh, Asian countries, the uh, Bangladesh, hardest hit uh, Central Africa, uh, small island states um, in Southeast Asia. These are the creditors, if you look at a vulnerability index. These are the people who really should be paid because of the damage done uh, in the North, if you take seriously a sort of polluter pays narrative. And that's particularly important for Africa, where, as the University of Texas is measuring, vulnerabilities are so extreme in areas that have been hit by major civil wars, basically over resources, from Darfur and the Great Lakes region um, uh, and uh, Uganda and over to um, uh, West Africa. Now, it's here that in developing a, an analysis of a climate debt, we need a great uh, deal more help from our colleagues in public health because, as The Lancet puts it, climate change is the greatest global health threat. And there are many initiatives to do this. I'm sure those of you in um, the health sector are going to be describing a great many more tomorrow. So I'll just flag one uh, that's done by uh, this very uh, impressive network that uh, Healthcare Without Harm in San Francisco has set up. Uh, a global call to action. And they're easy to find at no burn dot, uh, or sorry, no harm dot org. Um, and it very much uh, represents a, a site of interaction between health activists and, um, and the uh, professionals. I think if I, if I go through each of the steps uh, in this global call that they made in Durban, uh, it would uh, take us all night. It's a wonderful uh, attempt, and I hope we'll do more of that tomorrow. But I'll just flag for you the protection of human health as a primary objective, and equity and the common but differentiated responsibilities. That principle is what the US most wants to get rid of in climate negotiations. That's Todd Stern's maximum enemy, is that phrase, common but differentiated responsibilities, because it means the US owes more and should make bigger cuts. Um, the reduction of uh, local and global pollution, making sure that we connect the dots between mercury in the air and the land and the water caused by burning coal um, with climate, so local and global together. And that's the sort of narrative that it seems to me Jim Yong Kim, the new World Bank president, um, has begun to tap into. So that's his professional background. And then critically, I'll come back more to this now, the funding to address the health impacts of climate change. How do we arrange those in a way that's fair? And you got a sense from the bill, the German Watch NGO bill, that you could appeal to people on the basis that they are part of the problem. I certainly feel this with my flying around the world so much. Um, the North, the global North, I live in Durban in a comfortable middle class scene, and I'm in the global North. And it's the importance of beginning to address class differentiation within the North-South divide that this brings up. I'm gonna argue that solidaristic appeals to address that can be made quite importantly once we agree on the nature of the problem. And that's increasingly easy, uh, even for economists. Here's a group at Berkeley led by Richard Norgard, whose um, peer reviewed work is really measuring the impact of ecological debt. And if you take um, extraordinary cases, I'll show you in a little bit of detail my favorite one uh, because it's been in the news a little bit. Has anyone heard of Yasuni? Does that ring a bell? Yasuni is in Ecuador. It's an extraordinary place. I took this picture um, on an on a, um, expedition with this uh, extraordinary network in Quito called Acción Ecológica and Oil Watch. And this beautiful land, which is the most biodiverse in the world, um, uh, this many scientists have, have found this, is about to be drilled for oil. Paradise under threat. Um, and the reason is that the attempt to save it up until last August that was mainly generated through elite negotiations by uh, Rafael Correa, the president of Ecuador. I'm sure you've heard of Correa as a sort of lefty. He did his PhD in economics at University of Illinois and I'm sure like University of Washington, you know, you kind of, you get, you get neoliberal economics. But what he really wanted to do with this land was to carbon trade it, to make it an offset. So he kind of had a fake negotiation with the North. And I say fake because this is the perfect example where those of us in the North 
should say, protect this. Stop the $10 billion of oil from being extracted from paradise. Let's make this a case of paying a climate debt so that this area is protected. And it's not just the ecology. There's two um, uh, Native American uh, indigenous peoples um, uh, uh, groups that have never had outside contact. Um, they're a very, very important place uh, symbolically, but, but materially. It's, once we can save this part of the Amazon, much else will follow. You'll see it's right on the corner of Ecuador and Peru, and it's within a big um, uh, protected area, but uh, under threat. And if you know Ecuador, anybody from Ecuador, or you've been to Ecuador, you'll know that just to the northwest is where Texaco spilled $8 billion. Texaco is now Chevron. And there's a lawsuit to try to get them to cough up that money, and it's you know, Texaco or Chevron lawyers are, are going crazy fighting against this. Um, but I would um, encourage you to get into um, uh, awareness of this project as a beautiful case study through Axion Ecologica. Last week, Axion Ecologica and CONAI, the Indigenous Peoples Advocacy Group, filed 730,000 signatures in a national referendum bid to save Yasuni. And it turns out that Yasuni is already being um, explored by Chinese and Brazilian capital as, okay, Western multinationals, you guys are out. Oh, BRICS, you're coming in. And this is then the kind of challenge that we all face. You know, if it's a, if it's a Seattle company like a Microsoft doing something bad, well, we'll count on you in Seattle to come to the uh, rescue and support the activists in some far off corner. Uh, let's say it's uh, Foxconn in China to get some solidarity going, right? Well, um, this is going to be much harder if it's, if it's Chinese capital. Um, and the problem with what uh, Rafael Correa did, he relied on elite deal making with, in this case, a German called Dirk Niebel, who was the proximate cause of killing our hope that Yasuni could be a climate debt pilot. Because he wanted, like Rafael Correa, he wanted Yasuni to be a, a pilot for carbon trading. In other words, to put it out on the markets, the UNDP was ready to do a deal. And then they didn't find they had any money in their fund. So Correa had gone around with his allies to shake down northern elites. What I'm arguing is a different approach, a solidaristic approach, that the entire world, and especially the global north, can really buy into, that the need to leave the oil in the soil, and the coal in the hole, and the tar sand in the land, and the fracking shale gas under the grass, these are the sort of sentiments that it seems to me we can go to ordinary Germans, like those who watch the bill, and say, this requires the kind of contribution. And we've found a second pilot that makes a similar case, because I've described an ecological pilot for paying a carbon uh, a climate debt um, in a direct way. And this is what's being strategized in Ecuador. In Namibia, we'll take a second case about addressing loss and damage, this new category that's come up. I should say that even though right after Sandy, the $60 billion bill that all of you paid as taxpayers, loss and damage was on the Doha COP18 agenda. But the United States refused to allow the word liability to be connected in any way. So you kind of have a, an understanding. Oh, yeah, $60 billion damage in a day and a half. Last week, they kind of said, oh, that's bad. But it just happened. Nobody's to blame. And so one of the problems in generating this is to say, well, if not to blame, how do, it, how do we at least acknowledge that there are ways to transfer funds that should empower um, the northern donors as well? And this is a very nice example, I think, because in a pilot project, which, by the way, some of you who are in anthropology you probably know the name Jim Ferguson, a great anthropologist who's chair at Stanford. And he spent some time doing ethnographic work in um, uh, Ochevera, Namibia, which is about an hour and a half to the east of Vintok, the capital, and a classic site, desertification problems. The men go into Vintok, into the city, to look for work, a migrant labor base. And so there's about 1,000 families, women-headed households. And when they were given the equivalent of nine US dollars a month per person, a grandmother, seven children, grandchildren, maybe the middle layer is in many cases in Southern Africa is missing because of AIDS. When you see the impact of even that small amount, 42% of the children malnourished, and that was dropped to 10% um, in uh, the pilot years that this was attempted a couple of years ago. Higher attendance, better fed children, a drop in crime, poverty rates declined, unemployment. We have here, I think, the second pilot type, which is a 
a, a social pilot project for arguing for a climate debt to be acknowledged and to be paid. Um, and that brings us to whether there's a coherence in a philosophy called climate justice, especially that got its marching orders in April 2010. In fact, it's interesting, Josh Carliner, the uh, leader of Healthcare Without Harm, is doing very visionary work on making the connections between climate and health, also can claim to have used the, fr the phrase climate justice in the first formal use, which was 10 years before this in a Copenhagen conference when he was directing um, uh, the, the group called Corp Watch. Corp Watch is still a very important group for watchdog and corporations. But what happened 10 years later finally is 35,000 people met a few months after the Copenhagen failure. And they put this sort of list of arguments together for what's needed. I won't go through all the details, but certainly the climate debt, the need to address the liability of the North to the South, but not to use carbon markets to avoid uh, the techniques of ecological modernization, including what's called RED, the reducing emissions through deforestation, forest degradation strategy, that's all the rage. And those of you in Washington are implicitly involved in this through um, the carbon markets that exist here in California. It's just started up and it's very, very controversial. For some silly reason, the then governor Arnold Schwarzenegger decided to launch carbon markets as a way to make uh, uh, California comply with its, um, its emissions cuts. And where did he use to start this project? Does anybody know? Chiapas, Mexico. Oh, yeah, yeah. Zapatistas, right? Bring them on. That sort of macho uh, aggression from Schwarzenegger failed, and so he's had to withdraw from that. So I think these are the sorts of things that now draw us not into any global scale political project, although the Venezuelans are trying to resurrect a project like this for later in the year. But something that starts climate justice now from below. And here's where we jump scales back. And I'll just give you a couple of examples that bring me close to home. Um, one is the biggest World Bank loan ever, which was in April 2010. And again, that's some of your tax money at work. It's $3.75 billion to build the largest coal-fired power plant under construction in the world today. Um, and lots of protesters came out because when you put $3.75 billion and a lot more money into a coal-fired power plant, you've got a big problem of forcing poor people to pay more to repay the principal and the interest, especially if, like your South Africa or most countries, your currency crashes. We've had amazing currency crashes, an effective real interest rate that's forced the price of electricity on poor people up 150%. Those of you in public health know immediately what that does. If you switch from uh, an electricity connection in your house that you were using for your hot plate uh, or for uh, boiling water, and now start using dirty energy. You start burning coal or wood or paraffin instead of your electricity because the prices have gone up. What do you do for respiratory infections? What do you do for bringing TB to, um, uh, and, and other uh, causes of uh, well, opportunistic infections from uh, HIV positive to full-blown AIDS. So this becomes a terrible uh, problem for health professionals. Now this particular health professional is quite interesting because having run Partners in Health with Paul Farmer, is that a group most of you have heard of, right? Very heroic group working in Haiti and Rwanda, um, in uh, uh, I think in, was it Ecuador or Peru? A very impressive group in many respects. There are some amazing critiques because those of you in anthropology know he has a PhD from Harvard in Anthrop. So in between working the AIDS uh, and especially alternative uh, generic medicines at the WHO, Jim Yong Kim ran Dartmouth uh, College. And in that role, he was asked by the alumni, hmm, okay, the alumni, as you may know, even at UW, maybe not as bad as Dartmouth. At Dartmouth, I think they have a pride in training the 1%, as they're called, right? The reproduction of the 1%. If you're a nice kid from Phillips Exeter and you go to Dartmouth and you're, you know, you're a good kid, you need to be trained in 1% technique. So they have a technique there for that called hazing. And that means you are doing all manner of things. The problem of hazing and drunkenness and it's a real public health hazard. Jim Yong Kim was asked by the alumni and he had this famous quote, Rolling Stone magazine pulled out as he became World Bank president. The quote was when he was asked by the alumni, uh, Dr. Kim, you do respect our traditions. 1% reproduction, hazing, that's what they meant. And he said, ah, yes, I'm an anthropologist. When we come into contact with the culture, we look, we don't touch. 
these World Bank economists who read this uh, Rolling Stone report about the hazing scandal just must have been so relieved. Because what has Jim Yong Kim done at the World Bank? There's a big question because rolling over that uh, the next tranches for the ESCOM loan, as well as new coal-fired power plants, has been a point of real controversy. And about a year, or a little less than a year ago, Jim Yong Kim took a decision with his directors, which was quite courageous, to not do more coal-fired power plants. Now, there's a big problem, which those of you in Washington State must know about. Oh, instead of coal-fired power plants, let's do mega dams. So you've got lots of dams here that are under contestation. Um, I'm not going to say that the World Bank's reformed, and I've got a deep critique of Jim Yong Kim, so do many anthropologists. But it is a very interesting moment. And it brings us to the next big challenge for Jim Kim, which is mega project financing, which is what our second case study of connecting the dots using climate arguments against these sorts of destructive, socially and ecologically destructive projects. Later, perhaps, we can show a little six minute movie where we try to lay out why something you're doing in Seattle and we're doing in Durban and every port city is doing is very, very problematic. And that's um, the need to connect a variety of dots between issue areas and think globally and act locally. Here's how we do it in the area that I live in, in South Durban, which is a beautiful area, but it's unfortunately the armpit of, um, of Africa because it's the most toxic place. Has anyone been to Durban? Do you know our little, uh, so some of you, have you been to South Durban? Before May 2010, you would have flown in to this area here. This is the airport uh, before the World Cup generated a new ridiculous white elephant airport. And what we found um, in uh, South Durban with extraordinary emissions of the biggest uh, oil refining complex in Africa, Toyota car assembly, a big paper mill, um, huge uh, petrochemical complex, and then the biggest port in Africa with massive container terminals and a lot of illicit trucking, which is highly dangerous. Uh, we've had 7,000 truck accidents last year. And one in September killed 24 people, working class commuters. And this is the strategy to make that eight times worse <laughs> by expanding. And part of the expansion is volume, but it's basically an expansion that you are also witnessing all over the west coast of the United States, which is digging out deep. And the port has all manner of problems in um, displacing people, probably over 10,000 people in working class areas, including an area that Mahatma Gandhi lived in, Clarewood. Um, the attempt we've been making is to say, well, what about climate? When you take the existing port and turn it into this size a container terminal to go from two and a half million containers of throughput a year to 20 million, then we're talking about a very severe impact on the climate. Because at the moment, most of these ships that you've seen your whole lives in Seattle carry about 5,000. At that point, they go post Panamax. Um, there's a whole tradition now, which Seattle will probably benefit, certainly Vancouver, as being hub and spoke for smaller ports in which these massive post Panamax ships comes in. And now in Vancouver and Seattle, you're definitely one of the main sites for uh, world shipping. But there's a problem, a bottleneck at the Panama Canal. So again, watch where your tax monies and your consumer monies are going as these containers now number 18,000 on the ship, 18,000, super post Panamax, the Panama Canal is too small and needs to be dug out, which is what's happening at a cost of five and a half billion. But at the same time, there's a problem in the North Pole, which is shrinking ice, which means for shipping companies, fantastic, we can cut through in the summers. And this uh, ice shrinkage means we'll save lots of money and we'll increase our uh, speed and our turnover time of capital. But of course, this means more bunker fuels. And 4% of, of global greenhouse gas emissions now are bunker fuels. So we've been trying to raise this, and we really welcome the technical and the um, political strategic advice that you have if you're doing in the United States in a very advanced way, environmental impact assess, assessment contestation. A techie line of work, but we find that we're at such early stages that when you look at what's given in the EIA documentation, it's effectively climate denialism. You say, well, what's the impact of rising sea levels and extreme storms on these huge new ports caused in turn partly by more shipping? And the answer is, uh, we don't know, and we don't care, and we don't even put them in. So we're slowly beginning to link into a debate about climate that I think especially geographers working on logistics and shipping should really be ratcheting it up to a, a much higher level. 
It's the kind of local connectivity that we found quite important to do when we hosted the COP17, where this particular primary school has a 52% asthma rate, the highest in the world. It's right between the two main refineries in South Durban, and stopping emissions is a lifetime uh, project for the South Durban Community Environmental Alliance. Very high profile activists, Goldman Award winners, and so forth. But it's also for their kids, when we come to generational justice, a matter of life and death, with so many of them dying of asthma and uh, also a very high leukemia rate, which allowed us to do an Occupy COP17 uh, during the climate summit and have a big march in December 2011. Maybe 10,000 people out to march. And it began to educate us as to how local problems, this is one of the sort of extreme weather events that hit us in Durban, where we have these beautiful beaches. You must, some of you know very well, an extreme high level of tidal event and sea level rise, and suddenly we've got no sand on some of these beaches anymore, just a few weeks later. And that's the problem not just for rich people on this coast, but for poor people subject to inundation. In my last couple of slides, let me sum up with a couple of the responses when you're addressing this problem uh, in a place like South Durban that I think we all have to learn from to connect the dots and to jump scale. It's to take these local emissions problems uh, in carbon intensive development projects. This is our refinery complex. They explode all the time. And to connect, in this case, six weeks before the COP17, emissions, which are terribly harmful to health. I mean, in this particular case, 100 school kids were hospitalized because boiling hot oil landed on them with yet another explosion at the refinery, which is, as I say, located right in the heart of this residential area of South Durban. And that's that school with the 52% asthma rate, Settlers Primary. It's in this kind of context that I think making these links and having big meetings to say, well, let's stop these refineries becomes an important local and global phenomenon. And the one example that I want to end with, which gives us some hope, because I'll be frank, all these meetings, meeting after meeting, um, complaints after complaints, and even about two weeks ago, this was a protest that shut down the port in December 2012, but two weeks ago, this was a protest of about 800 at the center of town, and linking all of the issues you could imagine, airport farmers, um, the uh, fisher folk, um, some of the small business people, trying to find ways to generate a coherent approach to politics that is as inclusive as possible and helps to think about climate as being central. That means a rezoning to prevent the creep of the port and uh, to then defend and to generate solidarity in Durban and everywhere and to take climate rhetoric seriously and shift freight to trains and lower our vulnerability to trade. World trade and world currency are still out of control to de-smokestack and to have post-pollution, post-carbon. This, this is the anger that you find in South Africa. This is what they sometimes call number two for number one. This is sanitation problems that lead activists to use anything at their disposal, including, as you can see, human waste uh, in the parliament. But it's when the activists really turn strategic. This is, this is quite strategic because this is the Cape Town airport. So if you want to have power and threaten, I think in a nonviolent civil disobedient way, uh, the operation of commerce, that's one thing you can do. When Barack Obama visited, there was a little concern that this might get personal, but it didn't. It was mainly dedicated to critique of systems and structures. And if you think that it's so incredibly difficult to solve climate, I want to give you one last slide, two, okay, two slides, which would be basically about the extent to which in public health, a revolution occurred in the last 10 years. It's increased our life expectancy by nine years over the last decade. And it came because what used to cost $10,000 a year for one major reason, a monopoly, a tyrannical monopoly on intellectual property. Now, I know you have a resident of Seattle who has a lot at stake in this, right? Intellectual property. And I know that in the 90s, this is what the Clinton administration and what the WTO meeting ultimately was all about, protecting intellectual property. But something happened in 1999 to Al Gore. And that's when we began to find a social movement coming up to contest at the global scale based on the very local scale, your body. Gugu Dlamini had been killed in Durban doing AIDS activism and treatment education. Actually, it was, it was futile because if you said to people, 
um, AIDS um, can be beat. We just need the medicines. And they're looking, well, but we know the medicines cost $10,000 a year. We can't get them. There's no hope. So to make these generic and to make them free was an incredible strategy that led to um, the treatment action campaign's formation after Gugu Lamini was stoned to death because of stigmatization in her hometown of Kwamashu in Durban. And going through things like the World AIDS Conference in 2000, where Thabo Mbeki, the then president, unleashed some denialist analysis, and developing um, a lawsuit defense with allies like Oxfam and Medicines Sans Frontieres, and importing generic medicines from Brazil and India, allowed, and also having Nelson Mandela on side, because during his presidency in the 1990s, he avoided AIDS. He thought that would be a vote loser. So here are some of the moments in the campaign that are so inspiring and educated me. I have as a PhD student, Vuyaseka de Bula, who's um, the, until recently the general secretary of Treatment Action Campaign. And armchair academics like myself looked at that array of forces where you had you know, the US government, the South African government, the World Trade Organization, trade-related intellectual property system, intellectual property, and the big pharma corps against a thousand activists whose immune systems were compromised and who were stigmatized. Who's going to win? Silly people like me assumed that power would prevail. But actually, through a long and uh, amazingly potent series of civil disobedient actions, by 2004, this group had come up, led by Zaki Ahmad, um, and generated sufficient dissent within the ruling party that generics began to be produced. The strategic successes are similar to what we're going to need to do to connect the dots and jump scale. The successes are that we've gone from a life expectancy of 52, which was 11 years below peak before AIDS in the early 90s, in 2004, and today it's 61. So a nine-year increase, which I think is more or less unparalleled in a sort of non-war situation. Policy advocacy successes included commoning of intellectual property. Okay, I know Bill Gates runs my Microsoft program here, and he won't like hearing that, and he tried to get um, branded medicines into his aid center, so the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation tried to put the brake on this, but luckily they didn't succeed. Decommodification of AIDS medicines, which were so highly commodified because of this monopoly uh, tyranny. Destratification, so that it's basically available free to anybody. And critically, along with deglobalizing capital, so that we actually have generic production in places like uh, Midrand, South Africa, or Harare, Zimbabwe, or Kampala, Uganda, they're deglobalizing capital to make them locally produced. The globalization of people, of solidarity, is what's ultimately critical. And that's why I'm confident that with the correct perspective, climate justice, not the Al Gore solve the climate crisis with a market solution, with the right perspective and more of the solidarity that I've been looking for, making health central in so many ways, including this inspiration, we can actually solve this thing. Thank you very much.